So, um, Rudika, I would like to ask you some questions and um, and ask you some of the the basic principles of your work. And um, I we normally speak in German, but I want to do it in English to make it also possible to understand for people that don't speak German. Okay. And that already brings me actually to the subject of language, which um, and words, words. So the importance of words actually also um, in life, but also as a as a as a therapist, maybe or much more than that, of course. But what is what? What can you say about words? What's the first thing that comes? To your mind when I ask you about that? Yeah, I, then I think of the Bible, of the epist epistle of John. The first word is, in the beginning was the word. And I think words are very, very important. And we live much more on words and the meaning of words than we think of. So I see this in the psychosomatic medicine, the, the words of the language and also what the body is expressing in his own language with symptoms and feelings and whatsoever. They come together, it's a really good, both are re really good tools to find out what is behind the symptoms, is behind the illnesses. So this is, you asked in the beginning for the basic basis of my work. It's just to find out what the patient is missing in his life. So in German, we ask directly, what are you missing? Was fehlt Ihnen? Mm -hmm. And the, the patients answer with what they have, their symptoms. And then they use the language of their body, but they express it with their language, with their words. And sometimes they are really, really very honest, even more honest than what the, the mind is putting out because the mind want to be respected and yeah, be wonderful in a way. But the body language is really, really very honest. Mm -hmm. So during, during psychotherapy, we even use this. Patient has all the time of the therapy, his hand, on a electrode and we can see if the the skin resistance is changing by this we can see that uh, what reactions there are and if he has said what is really important the truth his truth so we use this really and to find out what is behind the symptoms is very very meaningful for me because I think that behind every symptom in the body or in the soul on the soul level or every problem in life, behind this is shadow. Shadow aspects which couldn't express in the conscious mind. And then they sank to what Carl Gustav Jung, the Swiss therapist mm -hmm. say, uh, called the shadow, the unconscious. And if I want to bring them up again, because we think that the shadow is our really, really most important energy reservoir. Yeah, it's like something really, really uh, precious and we have to bring it up. So much energy, energy is blocked in the shadow. Like say someone has an allergy so maybe he takes cortisone or he takes antihistaminica or medicine pharmacies like this so from the antihistaminica he is even tired and from the cortisone all his main system uh, what we call the grunts the grunt system the basis system is in a, in a way blocked and if he can find out what is behind his allergy or this aggression power, which is blocked there, then he, don't, he doesn't need those pharmacies anymore that already gives him much more energy. And if he uh, 
let this aggression out and in a, in a constructive way. I mean, aggression is nothing bad. It can be bad if you murder someone or rape someone, or horrible things, of course. But there's also courage and decision making and confrontation of problems, things like this. And Akredi, the Latin word, is not a bad word. It's just getting started. Started up was a song by Mick, uh, Mick Jagger. <laughs> so it's a good energy if we start. We get on and confront our problems, our symptoms. So if you get all this energy out of this blocked situation, you have it, you can use it. It's really a very good thing. And so you find behind every symptom a principle or sometimes more principles. For example, if you look at a disease as cancer, Cancer, there's also a part is aggression. The growth is aggressive in cancer, but it's also the principle of growth. That's a different stage of life. And then there is aspect of self-destruction, another principle of life. So you have three of these principles. And our task as doctors, therapists, is to help people to bring this principle from the destructive way to the constructive way, from the unsolved to a soft way. For example, with the aggression, this is in the body, on the body level, this is a bad thing because the immune system is fighting these germs or viruses or bacteria or whatsoever. And you, in this war, you lose a lot of energy. You, maybe there's a even fever, and then with every degree of fever, the, uh, the immune system's power grows, but it takes you a lot of energy away of, out of your system. So it's good to bring this fighting energy of, from the body level to the consciousness level that you can confront these things. And you'll fight your battles on a mind level much better than you, to fight it, them on the body level with the immune system against the bacteria or the viruses. So if you have disease, or you look at a disease like cancer, of course, you have also find a better way for this growth energy to express itself. You can grow also on the consciousness level. You can grow from your heart energy. You can grow in a social way. You can grow on a spiritual basis. So, and also this self-destructing of the third level or principle, it's a very bad thing, like suicide or self-destruction, of course, but it's also the energy of complete change of metamorphosis. So deep change or what the Greek called metanoia, to really, really be sorry about what happened and you change it all. So you always have the two aspects. This is the law of polarity. Another very important thing of my work, these are the rules of life. So if you play any game, you need to know the rules of the game. Doesn't matter if you play rugby or suck, soccer or whatever, or Monopoly or whatever game you play, it's better to know the rules. And the most important game we play is Lila. The cosmic game is the Hindu, the Indian say for life. So the most important of these laws is the law of polarity. You know that everything has at least two sides. And for every electron, there's also a positron. For light, there's also shadow. For left, there is right, the opposite. So to to understand things, we have we need the opposition. I can feel only small if others are taller. I can feel only, only rich if others are not so rich, they are poor. So I need this opposition. And this is law of polarity. And if I, for with the two uh, sides of a thing, if I am very much for the one side and very much against the other side, this other side sinks to the shadow 
and then becomes a problem or a symptom. And I had to get it out of the shadow again, as I said before, and to bring it to a constructive level. So polarity is the first law, law of polarity, then the law of resonance, of affinity, and then the law of the beginning. All, all these laws are now proved scientifically. Malcolm Gladwell, this very famous science author and US best-selling author, he, he wrote a whole book about the law of the beginning. It's called Blink. The law of resonance, we know it from from the neurophysiology of the brain, we have this Spiegel uh, neuron, uh, we call it in German. So if you look into a mirror, mirror neurons or something like this. So if I yawn, could be you all, you yawn also, Marvin. And then we say, oh, this is, you know, it's an infection, but <laughs> there are no viruses, no bacteria behind this infection. But yawning is infectious. But you only have to say the word and I almost started yawning. So even in words, there is maybe an yes. aspect of, of a mirror. Very, very important with them that for doctors, for example, that they get an idea of what patients think of their words. For example, if doctors use the word tumor, tumor, then they just think it's a swelling process. They don't think of cancer, but everybody else thinks of cancer directly. Yeah. It's not only the words. If a doctor puts an X-ray to this light uh, thing and the patient has no idea of this picture, but it looks, patients look to the doctor. And if he looks like, of something like this, the patient thinks, oh, this is a heavy thing. Yeah. And often I have patients which are convinced that they are very, very ill. And I ask them, why do you think this? If I look at your X-ray, I can't see anything very important. But yet the, the, the doctor, the oncologist, he, I saw it in his face. Maybe he thought of his wife or his tax income tax or whatever. But patients takes it very, very serious. And so we, have, we would have to learn communication as therapists, as doctors. So the fear is the important thing. I think we have, we suffer today from. There's even scientific proof for that. There's a German professor Schröter in Frankfurt Oder. There's two Frankfurts, one, you know, mm -hmm. the airport and there's another one near yeah. the Polish border. So from this university in Frankfurt Oder and he made a very simple design study. He um, looked what happens if you have a patient which has a little bit high blood pressure and is in a vegetative dif difficult situation. And if you give him a better blocker, uh, and the English word, I think better blocker would be the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are given so, so many people. So if you take a hundred men and give them better blocker and you tell them that there's a possibility that a side effect of the better blocker is uh, erectile dysfunction, impotentia, impotentia. Then you have 30 from 100 with impotence problems. But if you don't tell them, or you say just uh, erectile dysfunction and the patient doesn't understand this, it's only two of 100 who suffer from this erectile dysfunction. So the direct effect of the pharmacy is two percent and the effect of the anxiety is 28 percent so anxiety and fear is a huge power and i i i hope that they just don't know what they are doing those politicians and those yeah. virologists they have no idea about psychosomatic medicine and anxiety is a part of this so the way we talk about things is really really telling a lot about us and produces a lot of reactions. And if we are not conscious about these reactions, we are sort of dangerous as therapists and doctors. Yeah. This is really, really important. 
There is something though, when you go beyond the words, um, you, 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 you might go to, to also other ways of uh, language, the body language or, or even other vibrational energy you pick up on without being conscious of it. And, um, and the, the, there's of course also something like stillness. And sometimes I think that the, the, the conversation that you can have even with a therapist and a, and a client and being still with each other is, is so much more powerful than, uh, it seems almost like being in stillness um, um, gives so many insights to who uh, to to people you know whether it's a a, a client or a, a practitioner it doesn't matter but in general um, um this is very, very true yeah i think one of my most powerful seminars i give is hmm. a nine day fasting with completely silence completely fasting and sitting in a sort of zen meditation the zen and after nine days of fasting, complete silence, and just sitting and looking or being, being a witness of your breathing process, you are completely different and things, a lot of important things happen in people. And if you do a, a breath session with a connecting breathing, after nine days of fasting, silence and sitting, they are really, really impressing results up to unity experiences. Think that yeah. things like that. So that's really true. But you know, it's even important if you sit with a patient or you stand up. So standing up is completely different from the body language. Yeah. And if there are big problems and which make the patient in a way agitated and uh, furious or so it's much better to stay upright okay and yeah. do it in this position yeah of course it takes a little bit more energy but i prefer also to stand like now i do all these things online oh, yeah. in the right position for me also the seminars it yeah. makes me more um alert awake. yeah awake mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I go back once more uh, and then you can go back into your uh, um, explaining about the universal laws of polarity, resonance and fields. But I would like to go back before that once more to the, the therapy where you work with the, the inner um, pictures um, or the soul pictures and where you um, have the, um, the, the, you measure the, the skin resonance of the client. Resistance. Um, uh, resistance, yeah. Would that be um, on a subconscious level or unconscious level? It's a, mix, it's a mixture. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not what we call deep hypnosis. Patient is conscious, knows what is going on. Yeah. But it is in sort of a, tra a trance. If you look at the brain waves, there is this, we now talking about problems, things, we are in a better state, better, Greek, a Greek number. Yeah. So if you go into a deep relaxation, we go to the alpha, and then even less brain activity is in this theta level, and there we do therapy. We can see this from the skin resistance measuring machine. <laughs> you, can, you can see where the patient is. And then it's best to stay in this trance level of this um, theta waves. Yeah. Even deeper are the delta waves of deep sleep. But of course, this is not possible. So we stay in the trance, in this trance situation and real psychotherapy has to go into this level. If you just stay in the better level from the waves, like we are now, it's just talking about. Yeah. So when I did hundreds of hours of psychoanalysis and we talked about things, I was just lying there, eyes open, and uh, she was sitting behind me and we talked about the things. 
when I, after more than 200 of these hours, made my first session with Torvald Detlefsen, we, we in, invented this new form of therapy. And so we tried to therapy each other. And I was completely astonished how, by the help of this skin resistance measurement, he yes. went through all my used topics, themes I knew would be interesting for my psychoanalyst. But he said, there's no, you know, it's just no energy in this. Go further, further, further. And even in the first session, we always do two hours, 120 minutes. He came to things which I never talked about with my analyst. So to make psychotherapy or, you go, or to go really deep on the level where the problems really are, you have to go in this trance level. Like with the guided imagery, there I cannot control where the people are, but they get at least into the alpha state. So, and all the other traditions or techniques do this. For example, silver mind or alpha training, they all go into this deep relaxation, but it's still a bit deeper and better if you go to the trance level. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, another thing, speaking about words again, uh, and language, I often see there is spoken about the subconscious mind and the unconscious mind. And there's often, um, actually, these are mixed or used as being the same. Um, how would you uh, um, describe it as, as being what they are? Yeah, there's a, a big difference. I mean, now we are on a conscious level talking about things more or less intellectual. If you go to the subconscious level, this is reachable for us. Yeah, with a, if I make you a guided imagery, so you can go a little bit deeper and we can go to the subconsciousness, mm -hmm. to the unconscious it's much more difficult. You can use techniques like breath therapy and to break into that. These deep levels, the unconscious, this is what Carl Gustav Jung called um, the archetype level. Yeah, this is the collective, he called it the collective unconscious. And, but the, also the Indian people, the Hindus call it the Akasha chronic. There were so many um, myth and myth, all the whole mythology, your own mythology is stored. It's important to go there, but to the unconscious level, it's difficult to go there. There you get via drugs, for example, LSD, for example, you get into this or ayahuasca or peyote of mescaline, all these things. We're used to go there, this, um, uh, if you look at Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, he used, I think, mescaline to go into these perspectives. Or uh, Marion Zimmer Bradley, who wrote this thick book, the, uh, the Fog of Avalon, this big ep epos. She says she used 30 LSD trips to go there. You can enter there and we try also to enter there and often this is also possible. But for example, if you don't remember something, you know, you know it, but you don't remember it now. It's most probably in the subconscious level. Then you concentrate a bit and maybe after a minute it's coming. Or you do such a trick and say, okay, if I come back from my power nap, I will know it. <clears throat> For sure it's there. It's not so far away from your conscious level. Yeah. So you can get there as you want. Yeah. With the unconscious, it's not so easy. <coughs> so. What about, uh, that was a little bit of aggression coming out. Yes. <laughs> Coughing is Joking. aggression. Joking, yeah. Um, no, I wanted to, I had a question about, uh, oh yeah, about your breathing, huh? the, 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 um, 
round breathing or or connected breathing. Connected breathing, we call yeah. it. Yeah. Connected breathing. Um, is it? Would it be possible to go with that sometimes? Maybe with little little moments in and out of unconscious yeah. uh, levels also. Almost regularly. I do this since forty years. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a doctor now for forty two years. I did this for the years. It's not so. Of course, English speaking people will not know it so much, but they know from Stan Groff, the holotropic breathing. Yeah. It's not the same aim. And Stan used it. He started with it later when he when the LSD was forbidden and the MDMA was forbidden, the amphetamine. Then he used this technique. It's about five, six years later than we started. Or Leonard Orr said, called it rebirthing. But this was different. It was with the open mouth and only with one person and combined with all these affirmation things. But Stan Groff used the same technique, but he wants to get these transpersonal experiences. That's what made him well known in science. And we just do it to get near to unity experiences. And, but on the way to this, there's very often uh, that you ca come into this unconscious way where you see things which you can't rem remember because they are so deep in this, yeah, what Ji Jung called the collective unconscious. Yeah, yeah. So going to an experience of, of oneness, um, are we, are we for a moment losing um, our understanding or our connection, I don't know how to say it, with the, the polarity? H how does that work? I, I never really understand. I think it's, it, it, it's one of the most important things for people to yeah. go to moments where they realize this is oneness or where they feel. Huh? They will know for, for sure. If they have such an experience, they will know this for sure. Yeah. Never forget this. Like if people are after reanimation, they have the big accident and we're already on the other side and you bring them back with heart massage and breathing and they will never forget this. Um, you cannot do this, but it happens often. I do Zen meditation for more than 40 years. But during Zen meditation, a Satori, a moment of enlightenment is very rare. Mm. And you can sit there for 40 years like me and don't <laughs> realize so much of unity. But with the connected breathing, it's really, really sure that you get the most, the deepest relaxation, you know. And if you really go to this point of letting go, you have the chance to got it, to get into this unity consciousness, and then everything is different, and you have no doubt about it. It's completely clear. So if you don't know, I can say for sure you haven't experienced it. But you cannot do it only. It's not that you can do it only with connected breathing. Of course, you can have a peak experience, like Abraham Maslow called this, on the peak of a mountain. Mm -hmm. If you go there on your own and maybe for the sunrise and you let go of your backpack and you feel relieved and then suddenly the sun is coming up that then sometimes it's coming up also in your heart and then it's such an experience uh, well, the horse riding people my brother does this professionally and there's a saying that uh, the, the fortune of this life lies on the back of a horse. But if I talk to him, he, he is horse riding and this jumping professionally, he has never had this experience. But if you're free of ambition, this can happen to you. If you ski in the deep snow, I had such an experience, more than 2000 meter high, and this deep snow and you, you're just, you know, a gliding and sometimes 
from one moment to the other, I felt one with the snow and the ski and the mountains and the landscape. So it can happen anytime when you let go. But from the methods to get there, my viewpoint, the connected breathing is one of the best, especially if there are a lot of people doing it together. I did it once with, with 200 people and need a big hall, of course, for that. Or in Tamanga, our center, we can do it in the open air. We have a big meadow for this. Then there are chances that several people have this experience. And of, yeah, it's unique, this experience. It's no resistance at all anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, about um, Tamanga. Yes. Can you, um, are you, are you also in these times? Are you, is, is it, are you actively breathing with people or since breathing is such a day, uh, it's such a, you know, hot topic these days. Um. <laughs> yeah, of course I did it all the time because we are in the open air. We had no problem with this um, shutdown. I mean, they closed the center like everywhere in Austria twice this year, but we did all this breathing work because in the open air with this distance from one another, we have so much space in Tamanga. It's, you know, 110,000 square meters. It's, of course it's garden and it's forest and, but there's so much space, we had no problem with this. I did, I did a week with connected breathing and it's also part of several seminars. Now I'm, I'm on Cyprus now for writing and doing online things, but uh, here I don't work in, not with patients or seminar uh, part, participants, but normally I do this most of the time. Hopefully next year they allow us to work again. We will see. Maybe the vaccination calms them down a little bit, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I have one more question about um, healing. Uh, I read or heard from Eckhart Tolle, who we all know, I think, uh, the okay. other day, uh, healing is to be restored to wholeness not to be fragmented and lose yourself in the fragmentation of your mind. Um, that was really nice. But, and then I had to think back of, uh, uh, I don't know why I made a link to Colin Campbell, who also spoke about reductionism, but then in, with regard to, to, to modern medicine and the way we look at things. Um, I, I don't know, I felt a nice, um, um, oh yeah, you can do it on the, on the level of the mind, you know, it's not, it's not right to, to, or it doesn't help to me to, to be too fragmented. It's very important to, to yeah, yeah, go for wholeness and also on the physical level, medicine, everything like that. Now, about healing, um, what, what is healing for you? Is it especially on the men, on a, on a yeah, non physical level, mental? No. Can someone on heal? All levels. Healing is on all levels. All levels. And Colin Campbell wants to say with this reductionism we have in university medicine, it's like they talk, they talk about the patient and when you were a young doctor, I had these experiences in, in the clinic, in the hospital. They said, go to room number 17 and uh, take the blood of the kidney. Uh, the patient is the kidney, the kidney of room number 17. <laughs> this is what comes out of our modern reductionist system. Of course, it's the only thing they are interested in is the kidney. And yeah, and the nephrologist is a specialist for the kidney. The urologist is already coming from down side and they are not convinced about the same things. We have, from my viewpoint, a ridiculous situation in university, university medicine there. 
because the specialist for the kidney doesn't think of the liver, doesn't think of the skin, doesn't think of anything but the kidney. And nobody is just a kidney or just a liver or just a, a joint or whatever. This is a bad thing happened because of the pharma industry. The pharma industry cannot make a pattern of an apple. We know that apple is healthy yeah, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, perfect. But the apple, is of no interest for the pharmacy, for the big companies. They have to go to the detail, reduce this, that's why reductionism, to some molecules. And these molecules, they can make a medicine of and they can earn a lot of money from this. And this is what Colin Campbell is uh, yeah, criticizing in this book. Inter in German, it's called Interessen, Interests. But the English uh, title is completely different. It's a game with the words. And what Eckhart Tolle is meaning, the whole, not even the person, the whole, the, the whole human being. And so if you change the diet, that's what Colin Campbell has in mind. Yeah, you go to what I call peace food, whole food, organic food, and you can really, really help a lot of people with this, but you cannot get enlightenment via the intestines. This never happens. <laughs> it's very, very helpful to have a good diet. And also for meditation, because it's much easier if you eat vegan, yeah, this organic whole plant basis of, med uh, of uh, nutrition, than eating pork or something. But the final solution, what we call enlightenment or finding God or whatever. There are so many words for that. There you need all levels. It's good if you look also on the body level. Yeah, the body is the stage where the things fall. The problems you didn't solve in your mind, they have a tendency to go to the body, yeah, to somatize in the body. Yeah. And we can understand it and do the right things like um, living more a uh, positive aggression, more decision making, more confrontation like this and taking first steps, living courageously and things like this as I explained for the aggression and infection thing. But you can also, of course, change the diet because if you change your diet to peace food, the chances you get an infection are much less. The CRP number is going down this is the infectious infections marker for the body. Or you do fasting, or you go into the forest. The forest is really helping your natural killer cells. So you can help on the body level. You can prepare for solving your problems on the psychic level, on the consciousness level. But if you want to end up with enlightenment, you better follow a tradition of meditation. You can see it in the words as you like play with the words. We say medicine and we say meditation. Medi means the middle. You have someone is really in his middle, uh, in center, centered. That's where the old medicine wanted to bring us. And my medicine, the psychosomatic medicine, so from disease as a symbol or healing power of illness, books like this, they want to bring people also, the final aim is to go, to be centered and to get rid of the destructive sides of the principles and go to the constructive sides. So if you look at the main archetypes, we can say in every one of us, there is a yin part, a female part and a yang part. And you can take the female part, the yin, and make two elements from it. There's the water element, there are the feelings, and there's all the earth elements, very stable. You can take the yang and you have the fire element and the air element. And then you can take every element, we have four, and there are two, one, two, three steps. You know, there's the fire of the beginning. This is your aggression principle, infection. But there's also the um, charisma. 
you know, the sun, the radiation, it's the second step. And there's this inner glowing, if you're really, really convinced of something. So you have three steps. If you take the four elements and three steps each, you have 12 general levels, you know, stages of life or archetypes. And if you can dance on every level and come, come from the destructive to the constructive way, then you are near to wholeness, to oneness, to experience in unity. And if your illnesses, they are blocking energy somewhere. So it's good to solve this problem. And there, nutrition, peace food, is a really important step in the right direction, make it easier for you, making your meditation or your connected breathing much more effective. And regular fasting can be such a thing. Or in this corona coma times, we spend all spring and summertime, even autumn, in a hall in the in the forest. We have a forest hall. So we have you know, places to sit there and we can see the videos and there's a microphone, of course, you can do that. And you can see after one week, people are in a much better shape because then they have for a month prepared their immune system for fights with especially viruses because the natural killer cells are those like macrophages who kill the cells which are ca uh, captured by the virus. So you can combine all these things, but of course Colin Campbell is really aiming on the nutritious level, this food level, and Eckhart Tolle aiming at the whole. And so he is not talking a lot about symptoms and food and, and breathing and yeah. maybe relaxation in the in the meditation and things like this. But in the end, they could work easily together. Yeah, that's what my medicine is aiming at. Mm -hmm. There's a body level, there's an emotional level, there's a soul level, there's a consciousness level, there's a spiritual level. And in the end, they all have to come together to, to reach this aim of oneness. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're really talking here about holistic approaches, right? Where everything is. Uh... Last question before the end. Where do all these words come from when you talk? <laughs> Yeah, there, I have no answer. I mean, sometimes you can understand the words quite easily, but otherwise they come from traditions. In our medical language, a lot of words come from the Latin and also from the Greek, but there are also some Hebrew words from the Bible. So if you look at the Bible, you can find a psychosomatic medicine book from the finest, but also a book about fasting. So this is also uh, yeah, a fountain or origin of a lot of important words for us. And some words are just coming from the ego. Yeah, so because a scientist or a doctor wanted to become famous because we have a word, for example, like Morbus Mollengracht. That means if you do fasting, the, the sclera of the eye gets a little bit yellow. It's just for nothing, this word. People are very afraid if they hear, oh, go, I have Morbus Mollengracht. But this is just the name of a ego pro, um, doctor with ego problem who wanted to have his name combined to a syndrome. And this is a sport in medicine. They mm. combine two symptoms and make you a syndrome, and then their name is fixed to it. But on the other hand, if you get such a diagnosis, it makes a lot of anxiety. This is the problem or the shadow of this. For example, Morbus Alzheimer's, of course, a very, very dangerous illness. And this guy, Alzheimer, he didn't call it Morbus Alzheimer. It was, I think, Kreppelin, a very famous psychiatrist in Germany. He gave this the name of 
Hallo is Alzheimer, the Bavarian psychiatrist to this illness. This was not an ego thing, and this is a real disease. But today we have lots and lots of syndromes with names, which are derived from doctors who wanted to become well known. And what they got from this, most times it's just people are afraid because the word morbus makes them afraid already. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I don't have a feeling all the words you speak are coming from the ego necessarily. I, I sometimes have a feeling it's a big, big rain coming down with lots of information. It's, uh, I, I think it's beautiful. So I thank you very much for this. Welcome.